Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday, presented by the Hewlett Foundation's Cyber Initiative. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts tracking down threats and vulnerabilities and solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. And now, a moment to tell you about our sponsor, the Hewlett Foundation's Cyber Initiative. While government and industry focus on the latest cyber threats, we still need more institutions and individuals who take a longer view. They're the people who are helping to create the norms and policies that will keep us all safe in cyberspace. The Cyber Initiative supports a cyber policy field that offers thoughtful solutions to complex challenges for the benefit of societies around the world. Learn more at hewlett.org slash cyber. And thanks also to our sponsor, Enveil, whose revolutionary zero-reveal solution closes the last gap in data security, protecting data in use. It's the industry's first and only scalable commercial solution enabling data to remain encrypted throughout the entire processing life cycle. Imagine being able to analyze, search, and perform calculations on sensitive data all without ever decrypting anything, all without the risks of theft or inadvertent exposure. What was once only theoretical is now possible with Enveil. Learn more at Enveil.com. Well, I think most people realize, of course, that there's ATMs everywhere. That's Marcel Lee. She's a threat researcher with Looking Glass Cyber Solutions. The research we're discussing today is titled ATM Hacking. You don't have to pay to play. You really can't go into a convenience store without seeing one. They're in colleges, they're in workplaces sometimes, obviously at banks. They're everywhere. And they're not just owned by banks, but I discovered that you can personally buy an ATM and set it up someplace. And it's a way to make money off of fees and, and whatnot. So I set one up in my house for my teenage kids. <laughs> I feel like might, that would backfire on yeah, you. I'm I might sure as well. I mean, we're already money. there. Yeah, we've got everything. It's We've got everything but the cards. So, you know, it's, right now it's just known as my wallet. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, ubiquity is definitely a thing. They are certainly an everyday part of life at this point in time. And I'm sure there's some of us who are old enough to remember the days before ATMs were prevalent. Yeah. You had to actually like go to the bank to get money. I'm kind of dating myself by saying this, but no, <laughs> but me I- too. I, I mean, it was barbaric, right? Yeah. <laughs> to actually, <laughs> yeah, you know, talk to the actual human being to get your money. It was uh, crazy times. Yes. <laughs> So obviously, you know, you have this unattended device that's full of cash. That's certainly going to attract the bad guys. Uh, So I suppose ATMs have been a target since they were available. Yeah, they have been. Although, interestingly, the ATM hacking was observed much more in Europe and in parts of like South and Central America than it has been in the U.S. And I don't know really the reason why for that, but we're definitely seeing an uptick on these types of ATM attacks in the States. So it's on the rise. And, you know, as you saw in the blog post, I had a little screenshot there of a press release that the Secret Service put out about this just because it is becoming such a concern. So let's walk through the various types of attack and who they target, because not all the attacks are the same. There's some variety here. So mm-hmm. walk us through what we're dealing with. There are a variety, as you said, and it really ranges from a totally destructive attack where somebody essentially like blows up an ATM machine and just takes the cash out. People have been known to physically remove an ATM from a site and then throw it in the back of their pickup truck and drive off to some more convenient place to break into it without being observed by other people. That's sort of like what I would consider the very low tech end of the scale. But then there's also certainly what we would consider more of a logical attack where you're connecting malware to an ATM or basically infecting an ATM with malware. And that can be done a couple of different ways. It can be done in person where you insert a USB or maybe even a CD, kind of depends on the age of the ATM and the malware, of course. Or you also have the skimming. So the ATM skimming is more, it's going to steal customer information as opposed to actually stealing cash from the ATM. Hmm. There's so many different vectors. It's kind of amazing. 
and they're not that hard, really, any of them to do. I read a statistic somewhere that it's 10 times more profitable to break into an ATM than it is to like physically go into a bank branch and rob it. Hmm. So it's probably safer to not have to uh, go in guns blazing to a, right. a branch. I suppose it's a nonviolent crime. You don't have to you know, stick somebody up and probably also not dealing with a, an exploding die pack possibility. Although I have heard that uh, ATMs have mechanisms in them that if they're physically tampered with, that they can spray the money with dye defensively. Is it, have you run into that in your research? You know, I actually haven't come across that at all. You know, what I've found really is that ATM machines predominantly are older. They have older operating systems. The hardware itself is old. Uh, so that seems like it might be something relatively new that might be found, say, in an urban area where they're probably more likely to be updating things. But yeah, I hadn't come across that, but it makes sense. Yeah, well, let's talk some about the skimmers and dig in here. I think that that's something that we hear about a lot. And and it seems as though the sophistication of the skimmers, the ability for them to be disguised, to camouflage, to fit in, has really grown over time. Yeah, and the interesting thing about skimmers is you can buy a skimmer, like you can go online today and buy a skimmer device. They're not illegal unless you are actually using them in conjunction with some kind of fraud activity. But skimmers are, they're built to just basically fit over the actual like skimmer with the ATM. So there's, there's really two things, right? There's the legit skimmer, which can either be replaced with a not legit skimmer, or you can get an overlay that goes over the legit skimmer and basically is sucking off the information that way. So Two things are possible there, and really it just depends. So if they've actually replaced a skimmer, that's going to be harder to detect. But if it's an overlay, that's where you could tug on it and see, is it loose? Does it come off? If the skimmer comes off in your hand, that's probably not an ATM that you want to actually use. Mm. (laughs) So, And I've been known, and these aren't ATMs, of course, but gas stations are kind of notorious for this skimming device addition. So, so pretty much anytime I get gas, you can always see me tugging on yeah. the thing before I put my card in the slot. Yeah, I do the same thing. It's become a habit now. And I, I don't know what I would do if one came off in my hand. I guess I'd find a different gas station. Yeah, I would be super excited because it would be awesome for research purposes. <laughs> <laughs> but, Have you found one yet or so far so good? No, I haven't. But I will say I was in a 7-Eleven one day and I went to go get cash because actually I was buying a computer from some guy off of Craigslist or something. (laughs) You're just looking for trouble, Marcel. (laughs) I know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Anyway, uh, so uh, I was going in to get cash and the ATM machine was just in the process of rebooting. And Hmm. I was so excited because I got to watch the whole startup process and see the Windows operating system launch in the background, which that could be a whole nother thing to talk about for sure. Like, why is it Windows? But right. and then watching it launch into the scripts that start the actual ATM software. And, you know, I'm just standing there watching this in a 7-Eleven with people coming and going and nobody paid any attention at all. So that's kind of the thing, you know, with these ATMs, people just, you know, depending on where they're located, nobody's really monitoring what's going on when you're standing in front of them. Right. And I, I suspect that that's this, if you were looking to gather that intel, you could probably do that just by unplugging the box and plugging it back in. You could watch yeah. that whole boot routine. Absolutely. Super easy to do. So let's talk about some of the logical attacks, some of the, the malware based attacks, uh, you know, rather than smashing and grabbing or skimmers or things like that. Take us through what some of the research that you've found. What are people doing on that side of things? There's a variety of different ATM malware. At Looking Glass, we did a deep dive on some malware called Cutlet Maker. And this was a a report that went out to our customers earlier this year. And the blog kind of launched from that. But Cutlet Maker, it's kind of an amusing piece of malware. And, you know, I say that obviously with a caveat that malware is not really amusing. But but the GUI interface for this one, I think I have a picture in the blog. And it's like, you know, a funny little chef saying, ho, 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 let's make some cutlets today. Hmm. So it turns out that cutlets are just like we would think of, like a chicken cutlet is a Mm -hmm. dish or whatever. And these are very popular in Russia. But then 
after I researched sort of the background of the word, it also turns out that the word cutlet in Russian, which is like kotleta, and I don't speak Russian, obviously, but um, <laughs> it, it means like big wads of cash. So hmm. that explained kind of what do cutlets have to do with ATMs. So um, that was the connection that I saw. Mm-hmm. And because of that Russian terminology, it kind of leads me to believe that this might have been built by somebody who was a Russian speaker. Mm-hmm. So with the cutlet maker, you attach the malware or you connect the malware through USB. So you basically access a USB port, which is pretty much on the front of the ATM underneath a panel. Not that oh, is hard that right? Yet. Yeah, it's not hard at all. So there's no key. You have to unlock the panel. You, it's just, you can pry it off and there's, there's your USB port. Exactly. And even if there is a key, those keys are pretty generic and if it fits into one ATM, it's going to fit into others. Hmm. And I mean, we can talk also about this more, but getting parts and and things like that for different ATM machines is very easy. The stuff is for sale everywhere on the internet, or you can buy yourself your own ATM on eBay or wherever. There's ATMs like online stores. So it's not hard to, like if you wanted to practice this at home or mess around with the different parts, that stuff is, it's available. So anyways, once you plug uh, basically a USB hub into that port, and then to that, you're going to attach a keyboard because you need a keyboard for this, and then um, a thumb drive with the malware on it. Mm. And that's what starts the infection process. So you launch the malware, and it comes up with this GUI screen. And there's three pieces a separate malware or software that you need to use together. So there's the Cutlet Maker, executable, but then there's something called Code Calc, which is literally just a code generator, and then another program called Stimulator, which basically tells you what's in each of the cassettes in the ATM machine. So the cassette is where the cache sits. So it'll tell you, you know, there's four cassettes, and each cassette has... X amount of dollars in it, Hmm. or the one we were looking at actually referenced rubles, not dollars. So Hmm. I guess it just depends on on where you are, of course. So once you launch the GUI interface and you enter the code based on this code calculator, it's almost like a token kind of thing. And then you check to see what's available through that stimulator program. And then you hit a button that dispenses the cash. So It's relatively simple, Hmm. and it happens fairly quickly, too. So like that particular malware was built for Wincor and Nixdorf ATM machines. And this ATM malware is geared towards a specific manufacturer just because you have to kind of know like how it operates and just like the cassette configuration and and all that. Mm -hmm. Now, have they patched that? Do the manufacturers keep up with these sorts of things? In the research I did it would appear that the answer would be no. And there's many reasons for that. There's so many ATM machines, as we've already discussed. I had a number somewhere that like 3 million Mm -hmm. ATM machines. Yeah, I think that's right. So there really isn't a lot of benefit for, say, a financial institution to update an ATM versus the cost involved with doing so. They're not typically networked in a way that makes it easy to just push out a patch or an update or something. Somebody's going to basically have to physically visit that ATM. So just in terms of scaling that, if if some tech has to go out to every single ATM, that's going to take a long time. And it's not even just maybe doing a patch or an update. It's A lot of these machines are running really, really old operating systems. So you really would have to do a total revamp. And then is the actual ATM software going to work? Maybe, maybe not. So it's a pretty big undertaking to actually do those kind of like updates or patches, which is why the malware continues to be used because nobody's really preventing it. And so it's a numbers game for the banks where it's, uh, I guess, the, the frequency of these machines being hit and being emptied out is low enough that it cost them less to just let that happen rather than having to go out and update and patch millions of machines. Exactly. And, you know, maybe we'll see that reverse if we are having more ATM attacks happening, like here in the States. But I don't know, you know, it's hard to predict (laughs) which way that would go. But it is an interesting thing. I read somewhere 
95% of all the ATMs were running like Windows XP. And this is as of, I think it was like 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. It's hard to find like super current stats on ATMs, but most of the research I had come across was from a couple of years ago. But yeah, Windows XP, as we know, is not supported at all and extremely vulnerable to all sorts of things. It's a big issue. Yeah, it's an interesting situation. Like my initial thoughts are, well, why would they be allowing this to happen? But I guess, as we said, if there's that many machines out there and they're not easy to update, I guess it's a matter of slowly over time, these machines being replaced. I mean, is there is there a push for newer machines or to be, uh, are there newer machines out there that can be accessed remotely that as the inventory of machines out there get replaced? I've not actually seen that yet because just, the idea of networking an ATM like that also has its own issues, right? Because then mm-hmm. you're looking at more network type attacks coming in. Whereas now, because of how they're configured, you can't really access an ATM easily via the network. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like a, you know, which is going to be the better option if you make them network so they're easily accessible for updates and stuff. Are you just opening like a new vector? infection. People can come up with attacks to do things that way. Right. Now, is there any sense that the banks are worried about this? I mean, I can imagine there's, if I got my card skimmed at my local bank, uh, that would certainly hurt what I thought of that organization. And, you know, are they out there trying to prevent that reputational damage? I don't think that it's really viewed as a reputational issue, at least not here in the States. And even if your credit card gets skimmed or whatever. Like, I feel like it's such a common thing these days that nobody, like, I don't know. It happens to me so many times. Like, I'm kind of immune to it now. We're not immune, but inured to it, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Hmm. But even so, like, if my card gets hacked someplace, I'm not going to blame my bank. I'm going to blame, like, wherever it happened. And and chances are, Hmm. I might not even know where it happened. So it's just more of like a nuisance that you deal with and move on. I mean, it's an interesting thing. You're right that I think people tend not to blame the bank. I find myself uh, very often, uh, you know, using analogies when it comes to a lot of this malware, using analogies related to the medical system. Mm -hmm. And I think even if I get a flu shot, if I get the flu, I don't really blame my doctor, you know, like we all just kind of say, well, you know, maybe I decreased the odds of myself getting the flu, but... If I get the flu, well, every sometimes you get the flu, and I feel like perhaps that's where we are when it comes to these card breaches or you know getting your your credit card stolen. That we're all out there, and if you're using it, there's the odds that someone might get it sooner or later, and that's just uh, one of those annoyances of modern life, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. The part that gives me pause as a consumer is that obviously there's a cost associated with all this loss, and you know the banking industry it's not probably going to be absorbing that cost, right? It gets passed on to the consumer in terms of like increased fees and and things like that. So ultimately it does kind of hit our bottom line, Mm -hmm. but it's like the cyber thing and nobody's like really at fault. It feels like, except for some mystery hacker someplace that, you know, nobody actually knows who it is. Yeah. I do find it a little frustrating when, for example, like the gas stations, don't have the chip and pin technology yet. So if there's a you know someone that I interact with all the time, like I would love to use the payment system on my phone, something like Apple Pay, which has a encrypted token, so that's more secure than swiping my card. I would love the option to do that, but you have gas stations, for example, here in the United States seem to be lagging behind. They say, oh, it's coming, it's coming, but in the meantime, you know, we're getting... It's it's not as safe as it could be, even with the technology that's available. Yeah, it's, I don't know. I feel like we're very backwards here in the States. And I don't know if it's just pushback because of the cost of having to retrofit or replace things. Mm-hmm. But if anybody has been to Europe in the past like few years, it's like they've been doing chip and pin for a while. It's nothing new over there. In fact, right. if you turn up with a credit card that doesn't have a chip, then they're not always quite sure like what to do with it, I discovered. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so... Um, so it, it is much more secure. And I mean, personally, I use the mobile payment app on my phone wherever I can. And I always wish it was more available. Like you said, like at a gas station would be awesome. But right. yeah, it's just right. not prevalent at all. 
Do you have any general advice for folks, you know, both on the the banking side of thing and the consumer side of things? You know, what are the ways, I'm sure we all interact with these machines fairly regularly. Are there any of these uh, general hygiene tips that you have, uh, ways that we can reduce the chances of us falling victim to these? Well, yes, and more from the consumer side of things. And this is really just sort of ATM safety in general, right? But um, if you if you're frequenting an ATM that's actually at a bank or some financial institution, it's a well lit ATM. It's got video cameras, all that good stuff. It's less likely that that particular ATM is going to be, you know, have malicious activity going on. Actually, it's kind of funny. I was just thinking this morning on downtown Annapolis. This is not there anymore. But years ago, there used to be an ATM machine that was literally in the wall in an alleyway off of Main Street, if you're familiar with like downtown Annapolis, how mm-hmm, that's set up. Mm-hmm. And so I, I don't know who thought to put an ATM machine in an alley, but that would be <laughs> a perfect place to, <laughs> right. to do some right. work. Um, so, yeah, it's just, you know, it, it's the same kind of tips for any kind of ATM safety. And just the simple things like tugging on that skimmer to see if it comes off and then just being vigilant about watching your card transactions. You know, a lot of people don't even pay attention, so they might not notice if there has been some malicious activity on their accounts. Yeah. Covering yourself when you punch in your pin so people can't look over your shoulder. Yes, absolutely. And those are pretty standard things, but yes, that would be my advice. And I don't really have advice for banks other than consider using not a Windows operating system in your ATM machines. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Just a thought. Our thanks to Marcel Lee from Looking Glass Cyber Solutions for joining us. The research we discussed today is titled ATM Hacking. You don't have to pay to play. It's on the Looking Glass website in the blog section. Thanks to the Hewlett Foundation Cyber Initiative for sponsoring our show. You can learn more about them at hewlett.org slash cyber. And thanks to Envale for their sponsorship. You can find out how they're closing the last gap in data security at envale.com. The CyberWire Research Saturday is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. The coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Editor is John Petrick. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.